Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me today. So when we think about nutritional management, I like to think about it or, or leave this point with you. It's generational investment. You invest in the fawns that are being produced this year and how they grow through their lifetime. And then the fawns that they produce is an additional generational investment. You have to invest high quality diet, nutrition for their lifespan. And then they're producing fawns that you also have to invest uh, generationally and provide good nutrition. So really this generational investment in uh, improved nutrition can last a lifetime and beyond if you do it right. And we're not talking about putting out a little supplemental feed, a uh, feeder every 500 acres. That's not the kind of improvement we're talking about. What we're talking about here is a really significant improvement in habitat quality and nutrition. Now, how can you do this in a, uh, a region like the lower coastal plain that is sandy soils and uh, generally has a plant uh, composition that is not high quality? Well, we shown some, I'm gonna show you a little bit of our research where we looked at uh, how we can intensify your habitat management to improve uh, nutritional carrying capacity and thus the antler size of deer and body size. One of the problems uh, present in pine stands is something called mid-story hardwood competition. And in this pine stand, you see the pine tree, and then you see a bunch of green leaves. The pine tree, the leaves of the pine tree are well above this mid-story hardwoods. These mid-story hardwoods are essentially uh, above the reach of deer. They're oftentimes not good quality forage for deer and They've shaded out completely the ground layer, and so there's no food uh, on the ground for the deer. So this competition is bad for the pines, and it also captures the sunlight, so there's no forage production for the deer. And that's where a closed canopy, upper canopy and mid-story canopy, is a really bad thing. Now, most managed pine stands are thinned at 15 years of age, and that opens up the canopy significantly. Now, in this particular picture, you don't see any mid-story hardwoods, and, uh, and, and you also don't see any uh, forage on the ground level, but it's been thinned, and you see a whole lot more sky now, and so there's a lot more sunlight that's going to get down to the ground. And that's an important uh, change in, in the pine stand management, when you thin it and get some sunlight on the ground. So let's step back to that mid-story hardwood problem. You see in this upper left hand corner picture, there's a pine stand with mid-story hardwoods, and you see what's called a skitter. This is a skitter. It's basically a, a timber management uh, tractor driving through the, the stand, spraying a selective uh, herbicide called a mazapir. We uh, sprayed it. It does not kill pine trees, but it does kill a lot of the mid-story hardwoods. So this picture here shows a bunch of dead hardwoods. And then after that, we came in and did a prescribed fire. We, we treated one summer, early fall. They died during the, the fall and winter. And then in the, uh, the early, late winter and early spring, we came in and did a prescribed fire. And this is in the lower coastal plain. Here's a uh, comparison of a treated stand that had been thinned and the sunlight allowed to get to the ground and it was burned. This is the untreated and you see a lot of mid-story vegetation here. This is a very waxy leafed mid-story plant that's not good deer food. Over here we've removed this mid-story plant that is shading out the sunlight and is not very good deer food and we've opened up the ground layer to get sunlight. You can see some of the sun shining right down in there. And we produced a bunch of forbs. 
Now, forbs are a high quality forage, generally speaking. And then we, ran, we estimated the nutritional carrying capacity. It was a long, uh, drawn out study, but I'm just going to show you a couple of highlights here. This is the lower coastal plain. This is the arsenal and burn treatment. This is uh, six different stands of timber where we had the, the treatment, the arsenal and, and burn. And then this is the control where it was thinned but not treated with arsenal and fire. And this is the graph shows the number of deer days per acre. So the unmanaged or untreated stand could feed a deer for 10 days or 10 deer for one day. The treated area could feed 90 deer for one day or one deer for 90 days. That's a nine-fold increase in the nutritional carrying capacity following our treatment. Looking at the upper coastal plain, which is a, a different soil resource region, I haven't talked about that one specifically, it's a little bit better quality soil and has a little bit better quality habitat generally than the lower coastal plain. And you can see that by looking at this control that hadn't been sprayed and burned, it has 30 deer days of carrying capacity. Compare that to the control in the lower coastal plain. It only had 10 days of carrying capacity. So just the untreated is three times as great nutritional carrying capacity in the upper coastal plain compared to the lower coastal plain. So that would just tell you right there that the upper coastal plain is better deer habitat naturally than the lower coastal plain. But let's now talk about what we did within the upper coastal plain. We treated and we got about a 85 deer days following the treatment compared to the 30 deer days. So we had a, a almost a three-fold increase in nutritional carrying capacity in the upper coastal plain. So we have significantly improved the, the nutrition, and in this case, the nutritional carrying capacity of uh, properties in the upper coastal plain and in the lower coastal plain, so that uh, if you are in a lower quality region, and your deer are not big enough for you, do more intensive habitat management and you can significantly improve nutrition. And if you keep that nutrition improved for a generation or two or three, you too can grow deer just as big as anybody in your state. But it takes a generational investment in nutrition and habitat management. So that's, that's about what we learned. Regional variation in body and antler size is due to regional variation in nutrition. I want to thank the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks and their many biologists who we work with hand in hand to answer their research questions. They provide us with important funding that's made from the uh, Wildlife Restoration Act of 1936, uh, established a uh, excise tax on ammunition and firearms. And that money goes from the federal government to your state wildlife agency. Some of it is used for research, and that's what funded our research in this, in this presentation. And the rest of it is used by the state wildlife agency to support wildlife restoration activities within your state. So keep buying those guns and ammunition, support wildlife restoration, and wildlife management by your state agency, and also keep buying those hunting licenses as well. State wildlife agencies need fiscal support from our hunting population. If you liked what you heard today, you might check us out on the msudeerlab.com website, a one-stop place to learn all about deer ecology and management. And if you listen to podcasts, check out Deer University on your podcast provider. We think you'll enjoy both of these sources of additional information.